Whenever you are teaching, it's always good to innovate and to be able to take some concept like AFL and to give it another meaning uh, because sometimes AFL uh, is you know, it's the, one of our national sports here in Australia but it's also something which people can remember and put it in a different way of learning how to acknowledge uh, some of the mistakes of the past, forgive and learn because that's one of the things which really impressed me when I first came across some of the teachings of spirituality, especially Buddhism that we never had any punishment you know, in this tradition and that was really weird because in other places if somebody does something wrong you know you just want to punish them you know, really make sure that they realize what they're doing and all that really happens is is that people hide their punishments or they suppress their mistakes and psychologically that does a lot of damage to people so instead we have this other way of dealing with things, acknowledging, forgiving and learning. In other words, if you do make a mistake, you admit it. And because mistakes are so much fun, especially if you're in a Buddhist monk who is a leader of, uh, of you know, a community, and who has to do all sorts of things like marriages and funerals and blessings and it was only last year that I was asked to go to a, to a uh, ICU ward over in Perth there was a Chinese family and their patriarch was so sick he was in a coma in the ICU and they asked me, please Ajahn Brahm, come quickly, you need some, some chanting for him. Now my chanting can be very powerful. I have some very powerful zapping chanting. So, because you know, this poor gentleman was in a coma, just the end of his life, and all these other people, the family come from Hong Kong, from Singapore, from Taiwan, I don't know where else they came from, but they were just so sort of... Uh, are worried about their patriarch was about to die. So I really gave it everything I got. I gave it full power, super zapping chanting. And you know what? It worked. It worked. He came out, he came out of coma and he survived. And that was where I got into big trouble. <laughs> really big trouble. Because they said to me, they'd come. They'd, the doctor said there was no chance of him surviving. They'd come from all over the, you know, the, that part of East Asia you know, to be with their father, their grandfather on his last few days. They'd taken all that time off work, they'd already arranged the funeral service and I come along and spoiled everything. <laughs> and they said, Ajahn Brahm, we didn't want you to chant for him to get better, we wanted you to chant for a peaceful death. <laughs> I said, well you should have told me beforehand. Now when people ask me to go to a hospital or go to an ICU I always actually ask them first of all is that your wife who's uh, very sick what actually do you want me to chant for? Peaceful death or get better? You know, please tell me because you know, sometimes you can make mistakes and get into big trouble. <laughs> so I've learned from that mistake because <laughs> they had to go home and then come back again six months later when the patriarch died properly but they never invited me that time. And believe it or not, that's a true story. So when you acknowledge your mistakes, you know, you say something, well, what's some of the other great mistakes which I've done? Oh, there was uh, many Sri Lankans here that when I went to do a funeral for a, it was one of the parents of one of the Sri Lankan gentlemen, and he did tell the name of the parent who died, but it was such a long name, I couldn't really remember it that well. And so when I went to the funeral service, you know, to actually to lead it, you know, I was the MC, I got up to the lectern and said, we've all come together today, you know, to pay our respects to the, to the, to the mother of, uh, you know, my disciple over here sitting in the front who passed away so tragically. And at that, this old lady in the front, she stood up and said, it's not me who's died, it's my husband. <laughs> There's a 50-50 chance I got it wrong. 
I mean, yeah, you've got to get it wrong sometimes, 50 50. <laughs> and that was the end of the song. I never got any, um, any donations for that funeral. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, the other story, I just I'll do it things in threes when you make mistakes. The other uh, time I was teaching a, a meditation retreat just about a year and a half ago over in just outside of Kuala Lumpur. And you know, when we have meditation retreats, people come in for interviews. And this young lady came in for an interview about her meditation and she brought this uh, young man with her. And so the two of them were together and you know, she, she asked her questions you know, about her meditation for five or ten minutes and the person with her had never had any chance. So I said, oh, you know, this, you know, is this your husband? And at that, both of them, they burst out laughing. Because honestly, she looked about you know, in her early twenties, he looked maybe in his early thirties, and she told me, no, that's not my husband, that's my dad. She said, I'm only 16. And you know, that I said, oh, I apologize. Because you know, sometimes I'm a monk, I don't know. Sometimes you know, the girls, they, but you know, when I thought, oh, you look at least 20, you know, she was so impressed with me. She quite liked that idea that she could look older than she really was, so she could go to you know, the nightclubs or whatever and dances. I said, and he looks only in his early 30s, I'm, I'm in my mid 40s. And he was impressed with me as well. <laughs> so my mistake, they said, oh, they laughed, no, they, I said, sorry. And they went outside and they came back and gave a big donation. <laughs> <laughs> they said, part of that donation, they said, please use part of that donation to go and pay a quick visit to your optometrist and get your spectacles <laughs> checked out. <laughs> but the point is, that when you're not embarrassed to admit your mistakes, you can acknowledge them. And it takes away a lot of this, this guilt. I learn from my mistakes. Now when you don't learn from your mistakes, when you don't even acknowledge them, oh it wasn't me, no I never did that, no it's fake news. I'm not going to admit that until I see my lawyer. That is our current negative world where no one admits to doing anything wrong. And you know why? Because the consequences are just worse. There was this story of the time when in the United States they had a death penalty. They had a death penalty if people were, you know, and they would actually carry it out, execute people. And anyway, that, <coughs> that the uh, gentleman was being uh, interrogated or examined in the courtroom. And you know, he was accused of something which would carry the death penalty. And so after a while the judge interrupted him and said, you know, what you're saying is not exactly what you said in the beginning. You know, it looks like you're lying. And the judge reminded him, sir, do you realize now this is, you know, this is a very serious offence and if you actually uh, lie under oath it's perjury and that carries a, a very serious penalty. And the person who was uh, the defendant said, yes I realise that lying is a serious offence and carries a, a big penalty but the penalty for lying is much less than if I tell the truth. <laughs> And that's one of the reasons why you know, people lie, because of the punishment and, the, and, the, and the, the sentence which would happen. Why is it that uh, people lie so much in our modern world? And it's because the penalty for lying becomes much less than if you tell the truth. This is one of the things which, you know, as a Buddhist monk, you know, we want to get people to be honest, you know, to tell the truth. Number one, it's much easier to so we all know where we stand and what's going on. We make a mistake, we can admit it. But it's also that it feels much better if we can trust one another. And it's also we can trust ourselves. So why is it that people lie? 
because they're afraid of the penalties for telling the truth when we make mistakes. And of course the story where this all originated from was over in uh, Perth, Western Australia, in the temple there where I have been over oh, almost, almost 40 years now. And so you see many people coming to the temple when they're very young, they're kids, and they grow up. And so I'm like, uh, almost like a, like a godfather to, you know, like uh, an extra part of the family because I'm well trusted and I've been there a long time. So there was this one girl came up, she was must be about 17, 18, and she came up to me, just, you know, uh, tried to keep it private, but I can't sort of speak to people in private, I always have to have other people around. And she said, I'm in big trouble. And I said, no, what's happened? You know, I'm not judgmental to people. She said that, you know, she'd, uh, uh, she was pregnant with her boyfriend. And I said, have you told your mother and father yet? And she said, well, that's the biggest problem. If my mother and father found out, they kill me. Ajahn Brahm, can you please tell them, because they come to the temple. So it was my job <laughs> to tell the parents that their child was pregnant. And I thought, why are you so afraid of your parents? When a girl is in big trouble and needs her parents, most of all, they will hide the truth. Why is it it may be a boy has some problems with the police or with drugs and they're in big trouble, why are they afraid of telling their parents? Thinking that their parents will you know, kill them, shout at them, they're afraid to tell the truth. At a time when they need the parents most of all, they hide the truth from them. And to me that was where lying comes from. Why children would lie to their parents? Why husbands and wives would lie to one another? Why even uh, politicians would lie? Politicians, you're the human beings, just like you know, each one of us. And because they try and do their best, but they're imperfect, but we hold them to such high standards, standards which even you can't meet. And we expect them to be better, more honest, and it's so difficult. Because if they do tell a tiny lie, then they've lost trust, they don't have any forgiveness, and they have to leave. Very good people who make one or two mistakes and the people don't forgive them. And that's a sort of a terrible thing in our modern world. So let's go back to why is it that people lie to her? Why that child you know, would not tell her parents that she really needed help? And this is of course because she was afraid of the punishment. So she would not acknowledge it is the punishments which drive the truth underground. So we never really find out what's happening. So I told those parents, and I've said this many times since, for those of you who've got children, they're still young, learning their way through this world, making mistakes, please, can you tell them, son, daughter, Whatever you do in your life, whatever happens, as long as you come up to me and tell me the truth, you will never be punished, I will never shout at you, I will never you know, think less of you, because we all make mistakes in life, sometimes big mistakes. But, parents say to their children, this is why we're here for you. As long as you tell us the truth, really tell us the truth, there was no punishment, we will help you. Help you get through some of the most difficult things in our life. Otherwise, your parents and your children will hide the truth from each other. And even to the point, because one of the other things which I do is you know, marriage services. And when you do the marriage blessings for couples, that's one of the things which I always try to include. 
like a vow of amnesty between the two of you. For the husband and wife from the very beginning say to one another, look, we will make mistakes in our relationship together. I will slip over. I will do things which I'm embarrassed about. But, as long as the two of you share the truth, please don't shout. It may disappoint your partner, but even worse is hiding the truth from them. And that means, that's acknowledging, and you have the, the courage to acknowledge mistakes, because then there can be some learning and some growth from having admitted your mistakes and learning from them. You know, one of the, the ways to learn from mistakes is never putting a person in front of temptation. And that's one of the things which I was taught as a, as a monk. That, you know, if, you know, we're very strict monks and in the forest tradition, we don't receive any, any money, any personal cash. But it wasn't just that, it said, don't leave cash lying around. Don't, <laughs> don't put temptation in people's way. No, don't. Now we have the, you know, the problems in our modern world, you know, of, you know, the, the, um, uh, the Royal Commission into child abuse, and of course it's grown much further than that into domestic abuse and all sorts of other abuses. And of course, one of the important things is don't put no temptation in the way of your monks and nuns and priests. In other words, that's one of our rules, we're never alone. Because sometimes you do get accusations. That was an accusation which actually, other many years ago when there was a lot of accusations against monks, especially the Thai monks and that tradition, of having mistresses, and so I decided to make, make my, my confession in front of a packed hall of people. I said to them that many years ago I spent some of the happiest moments of my life in the loving arms of another man's wife. Another man's wife, she was married. We kissed, we hugged, we loved each other. Was that bad? You know why it wasn't bad? Because that was my mother. <laughs> Some of the most wonderful times in the loving arms of another man's wife. My mum. Take a seat sometimes. <laughs> people, they add two and two up together to get five, but you still make sure you don't, you don't have any sort of possibility you know, of uh, being compromised. But more than that, you know, we make sure that you know, if there is, you know, if husbands and wife, kids, if you do sort of get tempted or you, you do get somebody at school who's selling you drugs, or you do, your husband's wife sees somebody in the office who you really, really like. You know, tell your partner first of all. So they're there to help you. Because you know, a lot of people, which I know, they really try to do the, do the right thing. They really want to be good. They want to follow that commitment. But sometimes they just, they get tempted and tempted and tempted because asking for help is too difficult. And that's what we mean by when there's no punishment or there's more understanding, we can ask for help much earlier. Just like that young pregnant daughter could actually ask for help much earlier if she wasn't so scared. So that's why we have the acknowledgement first of all. Be ready to acknowledge, no one is perfect. That's why I just mentioned just what I uh, might uh, mistakes over the last couple of years. No one is perfect, but then we acknowledge to one another our failings 
and then we help one another out. Because when we do make mistakes, that is called growth. And that, for those of you who are um, devout Buddhists, who have actually read some of those uh, scriptures, the suttas of the Buddha, that's actually what he said. He said, acknowledge your faults. Forgive, and he calls that growth. That's how we learn and become better. Hiding it, not taking any feedback, is where the old mistakes get worse and worse and worse. No one ever tells you. But it's not just you know, acknowledge, forgive and learn you know, for yourself. It's also others as well. Acknowledge that your husband is not perfect. I know you tried when you were looking for a husband, looking for Mr. Right. <laughs> and, and you found Mr. Left. <laughs> but then look at yourself, you're not Mr. Right either. Or Mrs. Right. That was this advice given me to uh, this marriage counsellor over in Singapore. <laughs> that when she was, uh, got married in Singapore, it was uh, her father gave some wise words of advice to his new son-in-law, her husband. He took his son-in-law aside and said to him, he said, you probably think my daughter is absolutely perfect. And then he started gushing, oh, she's so beautiful, she's so kind, She's so, just whatever she does, a good cook. No, she's the most wonderful person in the world. I'm so lucky that I have met her and she's chosen me. I'm the luckiest man in the world. She's a gorgeous woman. I'm so fortunate. And then after rolling his eyes, <laughs> the father-in-law said, yeah, that's what it's like when you fall in love. You know, you think your partner is just the most wonderful, amazing person in the world. But, said the father, I know my daughter. And I will tell you that in one or two years' time, you will start to notice the faults and defects in my daughter, your wife. And I always want to, don't get angry when you start noticing her faults and defects. All I want you to remember is, if she never had those faults and defects to begin with, she would have married someone much better than you. <laughs> <laughs> it's called what we call these days reality check. <laughs> so we do have the faults and defects, but the point is we learn from them. We admit them and we grow from them. So instead of punishment, the amnesty. And that's one thing which I have noticed. There's very little forgiveness in today's world. Very little tolerance. I have one of my friends over in Perth. He is not AFL, but he was from Liverpool. And he was a devoted soccer supporter. And he was, you know, I took an interest in what was going on because my father he was from Liverpool, he was a devoted Liverpool supporter. And apparently they had this big match recently. And in the big match recently, the Liverpool team, they got to the, not the grand final, the European grand final. And they lost because of a goalkeeper, a stupid goalkeeper. And people started blaming that poor goalkeeper. And he felt so sorry for that poor goalkeeper. He made a couple of mistakes, which cost them the championship. And afterwards, it sort of reminded me when I used to watch soccer as a young man. Sometimes I'd be, be on the sidelines, you stupid goalkeeper. Even my old grandmother could save that ball, and she's dead. And it was so easy to criticize somebody 
when you are standing just outside of the pitch. You're thinking how easy it is you know, to actually to kick that ball. And many of you, if you follow the AFL, whatever, whatever team you support, somebody's thinking, how on earth could they miss that kick? How on earth could they be so stupid? You know, they're hardly trained. But then, you go and play, and you realize how hard it is. What it is, is we expect too much of other people. And we also expect too much of ourselves. We live up to targets which can never be met. Which is one of the reasons why we don't acknowledge the fact that we're human beings, not perfect. We have our failings, but we're trying our best. This world is here for us to grow, to learn. You now to learn things like our forgiveness, to learn you know, what is actually love. That's one of the reasons why that first book, The Opening the Door of Your Heart book, which now that's over 15, 20 years old now. I don't know you, if you remember the, the story of that book. Open, it was my first book. It's an interesting story. It's got nothing to do with, with the, today's talk, but because it's in Melbourne, and Melbourne was an important part of the origins of that uh, book, there was, I've given many talks, and they are actually quite helpful for people. And there was one lady over in, in Perth, who was going through a divorce. And it was such a, one of those terrible, terrible, terrible divorces. And, you know, when you, I've, of course, you know, I've, I've never been through a divorce. <laughs> but you can empathize a little bit to see just how much pain, you know, your hopes, your dreams, your trust has been totally shattered beyond repair. It's like a death a death of hope, a death of trust. And people grieve and they don't know where to go, what to stand, and their life just tends to fall apart. And this lady, like many others, you know, was suicidal. And apparently it was my stories which actually you know, uh, pushed her through, and got her through that terrible, terrible time. You know, little things like, you know, the, how big is your hand? You put your hand out here, and you can actually put it in perspective, but if you put it right in front of you, all you can see is your hand. She couldn't see anything except the pain of the broken hopes. You know, that this too will pass. You know, the two bad bricks in the wall. All of those stories actually got her through. And so she asked me, she said, you should write these down in a book. I said, no, I'm too busy. Actually, I wasn't too busy, I was just too lazy. <laughs> but I'm honest. But you know what she did? She was so smart that she said, well, I'll write those stories down instead. And so she wrote a few of those stories down and gave them to me. And they were so bad. <laughs> Nothing like what I meant. And I realized that I'd have to do it myself. <laughs> she tricked me. But I wrote them out myself. I've been saying them a long time. And then just wrote them out longhand. I couldn't type on a computer, just wrote them out. And then I got somebody to type them up. And this was so many years ago, they put them on a CD. And I didn't know any publisher, but I was coming to Melbourne for the BS fee for the Waystack ceremonies. And so I first stop was Melbourne University. So I went into Melbourne University, and after giving the talk, one of the, the people in the audience came up and said, oh, very good talk, Ajahn Brahm. You know, I work in the publishing industry. If ever you want to publish anything, please let me know. I read in my bag, here you go. <laughs> I didn't even need to look for a publisher. <laughs> That's my good karma. Anyway, that happened at Melbourne University, so Melbourne is really a great... So if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So, but anyway, that in that uh, sort of that book, the opening the door of your heart story, was again to understand my father said, whatever you do in your life, son, you're not going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. And sometimes big mistakes, where you don't know where to go for some love, for some friendship, for some advice. And he said, I'm your father. 
And wherever you go, whatever happens to you, the door of my heart will always be open to you. I'm your dad. I will never reject you, push you aside. That meant so much to me. It was absolute forgiveness. Here's my dad. And it took me a long time to understand where that came from. Because why could he forgive like that? And the reason was, and please excuse me for this little story, I, I told this a few times, but I would always ask him about my paternal grandfather, who was you know, from Liverpool, and my father would never talk about him. Every time I wanted to find out about you know, my dad's dad, what was he like, who was he, what happened? My father would never say, change the subject. It was only maybe a year before he died. I pressed and pressed and pressed, look, I need to know who my grandfather was. And that's when my father just looked at me and he said, your grandfather was a B-A-S-T-A-R-D. I won't say that word, but you know, it's a nasty word. And I couldn't understand this, and my father was just so respectful. What do you say that for? And that's where my father opened up about his life. In Liverpool, before the Second World War, depression, and my paternal grandfather was a plumber, out of work most times. When he did go to work and get any money, he'd be spent in the pub. Come home drunk, and then take off his belt, and he would beat any kid who just happened to be in the way. And then start on his wife, my father's mum. My father hated his father. Not so much because of the unwarranted beatings he would got because his father was drunk, but he couldn't protect the one person in his family he loved so much, his mother, my grandma, who I never met. And it was what he did. It was gross domestic abuse, child violence. But he told me, when he was opening up to me, he said, whenever I was under that painful leather belt, for no reason, I just made a vow. He said, if ever I survive, and people who have been abused, it's like, you don't know if you're gonna survive or not. If ever I survive, I will never ever do that to my children if ever I have any. And he never could. It was as if he acknowledged you no, know, the pain, the abuse. He acknowledged just his inability to do anything, which is one of the problems with, with, with it, sexual abuse, child abuse, domestic abuse. The, the ability, you can't do anything, and that just really uh, takes away a, a lot of your heart, your meaning of life. And the ability to actually to turn it around and give it meaning. To get something out of it. To do something better. To make it a better world. To make it a better society. And my goodness, that's, he did that for me. You know, sometimes that if ever I, uh, as a Buddhist monk, can have any influence and can make a little bit of a better world, you know, can actually take these wonderful teachings of Buddhism, which I love, and to be able to push them out there and make them help other people. You know, it's not just you know, one person, it's all those other persons, the experience of life, and that's one of them. Just to be able to, to understand that how we can take abuse, pain, disappointment, and to be able to take it and, and make it something which is we can learn from. We can, he would, I could never do that until he would actually own up and let me know. That's one of the reasons why it's important to have someone you can talk to, someone who can hear you, someone who respects you, someone who may not understand you. Because unless you've been there, you can't really understand. You can only half understand, a little bit but then you listen, accept, and just that acknowledgement. Because it's not just acknowledging to somebody else. 
is acknowledging to yourself. Every time you bring something up, you make it real instead of hiding it and, and suppressing it for yourself. And then you have the no blame. Acknowledge, forgive. And of course, you can see where I'm going here, to forgive yourself, which is the hardest thing to do. And of course, you know, in my position, you do listen to a lot of people. I know that people do not forgive themselves. Which is, you may think that Ajahn Brahm, you haven't been around, but I've been you know, into some jails, tough jails, and being able to emphasize enough so that many of the prisoners there can actually trust and open up. And you know, what I've heard again and again and again, in all the male jails, which I've ever been to, not just here, but in Singapore, UK, is that every one of those prisoners, they may act as if they have no remorse, but my goodness they do. They all think that, you know, I wish I could go back in time and not do that. So sometimes you can see that that's inside a person. But how can they actually do something? If it's guilt, punishment, push them away so that they can, they can never ever uh, do anything except do time do punishment to overcome you know, what they've done, then it, it doesn't work. An example, you know, you're talking about the cow that cried story. That story was from a local prison very close to uh, where I live, Bodhinyana Monastery. In fact, many, many times people have been going down Kingsbury Drive and you know, they don't know where our monastery is, there's not many signs there. And they go past it and they go to the prison. And when they go to the prison, they ask, are there any monks in here? <laughs> they say, no, they're down the road. <laughs> but anyway, it's quite useful having a prison close by because, you know, sometimes in our kitchen, you know, there are some uh, mice. And we can't kill the mice, but we capture them in, in Buddhist mouse traps. And in other words, we catch them in there so they can't escape, but they're, they're perfectly safe. But then, you know, what do we do with them then? And of course, the obvious thing is, we take them six kilometers down the road and release them in the prison. <laughs> we think that's, well, okay, you've got to learn some karma they stole from the monastery kitchen. So they have <laughs> put them in prison for a few days. They usually find their way back. <laughs> But anyway, there was a couple of students over there. They were, they were uh, used to come to the meditation class. And these two, one of the students, you know, he was in jail for, for drug offenses. And you know what the, a local primary school did? I shouldn't read, well, I think I can say what the school was. It was Jaredell Primary School. And the principal, because it was a long time ago now, the principal, you know, was concerned about, even in primary schools, you know, you know 10, 11 year olds had access to drugs. And that's a reality, unfortunately. So they wanted to do something to, you know, to help you know, children not get involved in drugs. How to do that? So instead of getting a sociologist or professor from town, this principal, just bless her, just her just her courage and initiative was just amazing. She invited two prisoners, people serving time, who were in jail to go to the school and spend the day there and tell 10, 11 year olds what it's really like and what the consequences are. And when I saw that innovation courage to actually to do that, now, the kids, they won't listen to, well, they sort of will pretend to listen to a sociologist or a professor, but get someone who's actually been there and, and, and hurt, been hurting because of this. It was wonderful. And when, when those, uh, the, Nick his name, I'll never forget him, Nick, the next time I went to the, to the prison, he just grabbed me by the shoulder and took me to this big board 
where they had these little cards which the children had written. Thank you, Nick. I will never get involved in drugs. Amy, please come and visit us when you get out. Signed, Jimmy. And had all of these cards of appreciation. And this Nick, he was streaming tears. He was just, rivers were coming down his cheek as he realized he was actually paying some of his debt. He was actually doing something, using what he'd done as a positive warning for other people. And I thought that is acknowledgement, forgiving and learning. Sharing your learning so other people don't have to ever go there again. But the problem is though that when we have this punishment and shame, we don't admit it. We just hide it. And it is. I don't mind admitting this, but or saying this, but there's a lot of cancers which happen. I don't know how many times I've seen this, people with cancers coming because of suppressed guilt, hiding it, thinking I was not good enough, I never did the right thing, I should have done better. And that is an inner pain, inner tension, which you know, causes your body to break up. And the solution is so easy. You made a mistake, acknowledge it. Don't punish it because that means you just keep hiding it. Acknowledge it, the old amnesty, then forgive it and we learn from it. So it never should happen again. And that's for each one of us, if you have made any mistakes, just tell your friends. Tell the people you trust and please have someone you can trust. If it's a young person, it should be your, your parents. If it's husbands and wife, surely you can trust one another and tell your husband, your wife, that whatever you do, darling, the door of my heart is always open to you. I just you know, want to be there for you. I don't expect you to be perfect. You will make mistakes, I will make mistakes. Let's learn from that so we can grow together. Instead of having prisons and revenge and so-called justice. You know, sometimes when I hear these, these things of justice, it's the old eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Where does that lead us? Even when I was young, I used to be into poetry. And one of those poets was uh, no, William Blake. And that's, I often quote this, vengeance to the tyrant fled and caught the tyrant in his bed and slew the wicked tyrant's head and became a tyrant in his stead. And that's just almost like the history of our world. You know, throw out the bad guys or the bad girls and what happens? We become bad. And this is, life goes on like this, it's gone on for far too long like that. So vengeance can never be the way. Forgiveness. And I've seen this happen so often. Your husband or wife, and sometimes people say, well, a good example of that. There was a, a guy, his wife was um, cleaning out his jacket and found a receipt, an invoice from the local brothel. It was in there. And she was stunned. So why are you going to prostitutes? Now you're married to me. And you know, he didn't know what to say. So eventually the two of them came to Bodhinyana Monastery. Spent a long time talking to them. And I told him, said, look, you know, what have you done? He said, look, I'm, I don't know why I did this. And it, you know, please, said, I still love my wife. And so I got him to actually, to, you know, to cut a long story short, to bow in front of the Buddha and just to make a resolution. He will never, ever do that again. And then to me as well. He will never, in front of his wife. His wife could not accept it. So I said, probation. Give him one year, 
And if he ever any hanky-panky at all, that's it. He hasn't got a second chance. And that's what he did. He took that and now a beautiful, happy relationship. They come every week to Bodhinyana Monastery to offer some food. Just out of thankfulness. He made a mistake. Big mistake. She forgave him. And it was worth it. He learned from it. He had to really make it quite clear to him. He'd, he'd really hurt somebody. So he had to learn from it. Give people the opportunity. And a lot of times will people take that opportunity. They become better people. That's the Buddhist way. Acknowledge, forgive and learn. Obviously there's a lot of generalizations there, a lot of specific cases, but the other way we just get violence, we just get uh, more and more people being afraid of telling the truth, more and more people just abusing one another. I never was going, I've only got a couple of minutes before it's question time, but you know I, I was giving a talk a couple of weeks ago about why is it we find it hard to forgive others? It's because we find it hard to forgive ourselves. If you can learn how to forgive yourself, first of all. There was <laughs> an example of this. This monk, just, just before I left, he was saying, oh, one of the junior monks was very disrespectful. He wasn't sort of listening to what he was saying about sweeping the roads and he was so disrespectful. And then I looked at him and said, what are you doing right now? Standing up in front of me, shouting at me. I'm your teacher. I ordained you. Because <laughs> it's that, that thing. We always see the faults in others which we have in ourselves. We always see the anger in others when we are angry. And this is also with the forgiveness. If you could forgive yourself, make peace with your failings. Just allow whatever happened to you in the past, the pace, the, 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 uh, the failures, the pain, just allow that to come up, to learn from it, make peace with it. When you learn that forgiveness is a choice which frees you and liberates you, then you can learn how to forgive others. This is where we have to start, forgiving ourselves. Has any of you ever done any bad things? Okay, I'm going to end up with a terrible joke. <laughs> Have we got time? Okay. There was a kid, we went to school one day, and he said, oh, I just, I just, I'm really broke, I've got no money, I spent it all on don't know what. And his friend at school said, oh, it's very easy if you want to get some money. You just go to your sister, you know, it's also in the school. Just go up to her and say, sister, I know all about it. <laughs> about what? I said, that's all you need to say. So he went out to his sister and said, sister, I know all about it. He said, about what? You know. How, how, how do you find out? Well, you know, I've got friends in school. And she said, oh, okay, but don't tell mum and dad. Well, it will cost you 20 bucks. <laughs> so the sister got 20 bucks out, gave it to her, his young kid. Now, don't you try any of this, you children. Because there's always some things we, you know, we, we don't want somebody to find out about. So, okay, ooh, okay. So, he went home and thought, well, let's, let's try this on, on, on the, my, my mother. <laughs> so he went out to his mother and said, Mum, I know all about it. <laughs> about what? Oh, yeah, I've got people at school who've been talking. <laughs> okay, okay but don't tell your father. <laughs> well, it costs you 50 bucks, mum. <laughs> and so mum goes 50 bucks, but don't tell your dad. Okay. And he thought, wow, this is a really good business. <laughs> <laughs> so then, then he went to see his, his father. Dad, 
when he came over and went, Dad, I know all about it. How do you find out? Well, the kids at school, you know, just, you mean all about it? Yeah, should I tell Mum? No, don't you tell Mum, don't tell Mum. He said, well, it cost you a hundred bucks. <laughs> so he got a hundred bucks out, gave it to the son. And so he said, who can I try next? And just then, just then the postman called. So he went out to the postman and said, Posty, I know all about it. And the postman said, you know all about it? He said, yes. And the postman said, son. <laughs> So don't try that. <laughs> okay. Okay, naughty buck. So please forgive me. I acknowledge. <laughs>